Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today's presentation will feature Danielle Updegraff, Clinical Nurse Educator of Centrac, Chris Thompson, Director of Clinical Consulting of Centrac, and Dave Weedman, Chief Commercial Officer of Vizia Technologies. Healthcare technology management professionals are constantly looking for ways to help reduce cost, streamline processes, and improve patient care. Clinical and RTLS experts will discuss how to successfully implement real-time location systems in hospitals. Speakers will share best practices, lessons learned, and ROI results from Go Live deployment at nationally recognized health systems of HCA Healthcare and Indiana University Health. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsors, Vizia Technology and Centrac. Vizia Technologies is a leading software and managed service provider of RTLS for healthcare organizations. And Centrac, whose mission is to help fulfill the growing expectation for hospital leadership to do more with less. Visit viziatech.com and centrac.com for more information. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win a Webinar Wednesday Webinared t-shirt by answering the following question. Earlier this month, one of today's sponsors was named IOT Health and Wellness Company of the Year by IOT Breakthrough Awards. Which company was it? You can find the answer on our sponsor's website and you can answer by using the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. A few announcements before we get started. We are excited about our plans for the upcoming 2021 MD Expo in Dallas, Texas on April 16th and 17th, 2021. For more details, visit mdexposhow.com. While you're there, make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you can receive the most up-to-date information. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We will wrap up with a our presentation today with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We will get through as many attendee questions as time allows. Please note there is a handout loaded into the GoToWebinar dashboard for your review. Please check under the handout section of the GoToWebinar dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presentation today features Danielle Updegraff, Chris Thompson, and Dave Weedman. Dave, you may begin whenever you are ready. Jennifer, thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave Weedman, Chief Commercial Officer of Vizia Technologies. Welcome to today's webinar titled RTLS Asset Management Clinical Best Practices for mobile medical equipment. As Jennifer mentioned, the two sponsors today, Physia Technologies and Centrac. Our two firms have had a long-standing partnership and have collaborated together to solve challenges for major healthcare systems across the country. The session objectives today include exploring the key components of an effective asset program, the importance of stakeholder collaboration, the identification and prioritization of assets, as well as go live and ongoing maintenance considerations. I'm excited to share this forum with two experienced nursing professionals today. So to review today's panelists, Danielle Updegraff, BSN and RN, currently a clinical nurse educator at Centrac with 20 years of experience, previously the director of clinical projects at an HCA hospital of the future, and Chris Thompson, an MSN and RN, currently the director of clinical consulting at Centrac, also with 20 plus years experience, 
who previously worked at a large IDN in Indiana, namely IU Health. But before we dive into the session with our panelists and to set the stage, let's review the financial impact of inefficient asset management. The negative consequences begin with patient dissatisfaction, often stemming from delays in treatment, leading to reduced reimbursements due to this negative feedback, and then inevitably, stopgap measures lead to increases in rentals, capital purchases, and finally, overall operational cost. Sound familiar? So let's turn to the experts with personal experience in how to achieve efficient asset management. So I'll start the conversation today and open up with both of it, both the panelists. Danielle, I'd like to start with you. What is the most important point to consider when rolling out an asset tracking program? Thank you so much, Dave. Yes, I think the first thing that needs to be established is uh, a good team. Uh, there are several owners to that, but um, there needs to be a overarching approach that one person trying to go at it alone and forcing a successful outcome, that can be overwhelming. So you need that team approach of uh, when you're deciding what you're going to uh, try to attempt to locate um, and all the way down as far as who's going to be responding to uh, alarms. So you've got the, you know, you need to set the stage uh, in the beginning. Um, logical owners are going to be bio, uh, biomed is, are going to be huge because they're going to need to find the equipment. They're going to service it um, for their maintenance or for that touch point. Uh, you also are going to have people like unit leaders uh, that are looking for specific things such as uh, therapy, maybe looking for their specific type of walkers. Um, you may have your dialysis team looking for specific carts and so they're going to own that. Um, but it's very important to set the uh, in, be very inclusive at the onset uh, to make sure that it is a team approach and you have those vital owners keyed in. That's fantastic. Chris, um, what what might you add to this? Thanks, Dave. You know, I, I completely agree with Danielle here. And, you know, the one thing I would say is creating a steering committee that's been empowered by that executive sponsor to be able to make decisions and is you know can consume the feedback from the end users, but then also to be able to respond quickly, make those decisions and implement changes will keep the momentum of the project moving forward. That's great. I'd add that it's critical that vendors provide support for a clearly defined change management process with the stakeholders as well. And Chris, to that end, let's talk about which departments were key to your success. Who were your key stakeholders? Thanks, Dave. So, you know, for our project, um, when we created our steering committee, our steering committee was headed up by our executive sponsor. And that executive sponsor was key in you know, garnering support across the organization and also communicating the why behind the project. Um, and it really helped to drive that project forward. Some of the members of our committee included you know, information services, which was really instrumental in making sure that the system was operational. Um, for us, we used that system on a daily basis and it was very key that it remained up at all times and so partnering with is to make sure that they understood the criticality of the system and that they supported that system as a tier one application was really instrumental for us the unit leadership amongst all the different units at the hospital everywhere from you know the ebs team um, and you know the clinical leaders the various support service teams 
um, and the ancillary clinical units, you know, like radiology and areas like this, um, were extremely beneficial to gather those business requirements to understand what we needed to deliver to them to make that system useful and a success and to make them want to use the system on a daily basis. The other group that was really instrumental to us was clinical engineering. Um, clinical engineering really drove a lot of the standards and the utilization of the system. And so they were really good champions and partners in um, driving the utilization amongst the clinical staff and garnering trust in that, you know, in our hospital to basically say that they were gonna respond in a timely manner. You know, the key stakeholders for us really were those, you know, unit leaders and then the clinical engineering team. Those were really our, our two major stakeholders um, for this project. Great insight, Chris. I appreciate that. Danielle, what was the biggest benefit derived from, from the asset tracking system from your perspective? Absolutely, thank you. That's an awesome question. And um, time. Time is what we kept hearing over and over. So uh, from a nurse, uh, nursing or unit level, it was uh, the ability for them to have more time with their patient, not going room to room looking for equipment. Um, for our clinical engineering, you know, those our biomed team, they were able to very quickly find the equipment that needed to be serviced. Um, and then as far as a hospital overall, when you have a locating system in place, I know one of the big things that um, we, we found is say you have a facility that only has a couple pieces of equipment, maybe uh, two or three bladder scanners. And if the bladder scanners are down in uh, Biomed for servicing, then um, the, the system can be configured uh, in or to change the status of that equipment to end maintenance. And so then that way, uh, anyone who is looking for bladder scanners know, wow, I have two over here in maintenance and uh, we only have one available for the hospital. So then that's where you can even get your executive leadership team in there and they understand uh, and they can look at, uh, at the system and that can help expedite uh, any kind of rental requests even. Um, so really overall, it's time, but huge, um, whenever you're saving uh, the time for on, on a staff side, you're also, you have that staff satisfaction because now they're freed up to do what they need to do, which is servicing the equipment or spending time with patients. And that makes, uh, that makes for a, overall a good experience. Well, and I would add, Danielle, that an asset management solution can have the important business rules drive system alerts that that drive the desired outcomes. And, and you outline the, the bladder scanner example. And um, so saving time is is no doubt a critical component. Um, Chris, what's the one thing that you would say was key to the success of your RTLS implementation? So Dave, that's a great question. And actually, I would say there was more than one thing that was key. Um, the first and foremost was really limiting the scope of the assets that we initially went after. You know, we went and we surveyed the clinical staff to really figure out what it was that was important to them that they struggled to find. And this was important because there's a lot of times there's equipment in these rooms that, you know, it's just routine equipment that's not hard for them to find. Um, you know, case in point, we, you know, we stocked a sequential compression device in every single patient room. So that wasn't a critical asset that staff were looking for. So defining what that scope, you know, finding the top three to five assets that are really critical for the staff and difficult to find was really important for us. The other thing that was really beneficial, and I think that this is just a key to any implementation of an RTLS system, um, is really creating standards around the metadata that you're going to use to define those assets. So how you're going to put those systems in, um, you know, how they're going to be defined, 
how nurses are going to look for them, making sure that not only does clinical engineering have the name that they're going to refer to them by, which is the proper name, but also that nursing has the name that they're going to look for by, right? Nursing is going to look for a balloon pump instead of, you know, um, you know, an intra aortic balloon pump, right? Or something to this effect. So really making sure that you pare down that meta metadata and get it standardized for everybody. The other thing is really creating standards around where the placement of the tag is going to be so that everyone knows where to look for that tag. And when they see it, they're not surprised. They're not going, well, what is this? Or they understand that that tag can't be moved or, you know, yanked off or something to that effect and making sure that it's placed in the optimal position. The other thing is really creating a good battery replacement program, you know, which really a lot of times often cycles with the PM schedules, depending upon what that PM schedule looks like but making sure that there's an owner of the battery replacement, there's a process in place to make sure that people know when those batteries need to be replaced and that they are replaced and that there's acknowledgement of that in the system. Last but not least, I'd really have to say the other big thing is, is really making sure that there are owners of their certain processes, right? So there's an owner of the cleaning and distribution process. There's an owner of getting equipment back in. You know, there's owners in clinical engineering when they take in a piece of equipment for preventative maintenance or something breaks to where they can communicate back and they have a process to communicate back to the clinical staff to say, we've ordered a part and that part's going to be here in two weeks. And they can see that and track that. That's great, Chris. I appreciate it. And I noticed your last comment on there, uh, PAR levels. We've seen that PAR level management is a great example of utilizing system alerts to notify the biomed staff when critical assets need replenishment or redeployment. So good insight. Danielle, what was the biggest pain point with the asset tracking system from your perspective? Yes, I would definitely say have a plan. Um, that uh, the system is going to require a little bit of upkeep. And that plan is um, it speaks to what Chris was talking about with battery maintenance, because um, you want to be proactive. You need to be monitoring reports uh, where you are seeing, I have batteries that are on my 90 day window and now, you know, I have enough batteries for that equipment when it hits my 30 day uh, low battery indicator report. And then that's at. You know, you don't want to live that nightmare where you feel like you're always wanting to put out a fire and now it's, oh no, I've lost my asset and I've lost my tag. Um, because you really want to have. Um, the the staff to know that when I go to the system and I look up an asset, that's where it's going to be. Not this is the last location because my battery died. Um, because then you know they're wondering, well, is is the system functioning appropriately? Is it doing what it needs? Uh, is it showing me everything um, that I need to see? So really, upkeep is key. Is having that system that process identified on the front end um, so you know who's monitoring it how often and uh, getting that um, getting those batteries taken care of in a timely manner great points danielle and chris to throw it back over to you you know we live in a data analytics data driven world what were some of the kpis that you measured and why specifically those? You know, Dave, you're, you're right. And you're kind of speaking to, you know, my heart, right? Data analytics is really the thing that drives so much in healthcare, making sure that they understand the data that's coming in and that we're capturing the right data. For us, one of the, the, the most important KPIs was around, um, you know, preventative maintenance for clinical engineering. Uh, prior to our implementation of the system, the rounding events, you know, to find pumps, right? So when we had our pump month, um, that pump month could take up to 12 weeks, you know, so it really wasn't a month, right? 
but it would take, you know, it would take 12 weeks to go out and find 80% of all the pumps. And even then at that point, we still had a percentage of those pumps that weren't found. So for us, you know, looking at the percentage of pumps found for preventative maintenance was really key. The amount of time that it took to complete that preventative maintenance was also really key. Um, some of the other KPIs that we really started to look into was around the you know asset utilization and staff utilization. Um, you know, nurses traditionally one of the things that we found was is that you know nurses often report that they can't find equipment that we don't have enough equipment we need to order more equipment and so we really wanted to understand the root cause of was it really true that we just didn't have enough equipment or was it that it was out of service um you know we weren't utilizing it appropriately so we really focused in on our asset utilization and staff utilization of you know not only the system but of the assets that we had and specifically what assets were used you know did we have the same you know five bladder scanners that were always used and we've got three that are sitting over here in the closet that are never utilized so we really focused in on this and you know this really helped um for us to really determine what our capital needs were going to be for the upcoming year and it helped us in our capital planning budget cycle that's great um to continue on that path chris you know what ROIs were realized after the implementation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. So there were a couple of things that um, really stood out. One was is we ended up saving um, two clinical engineering FTEs that we could reallocate and use those to better service the equipment and to do our preventative maintenance. And so we were able to by saving the burden of them having to go out and search for equipment and find equipment and call various facilities, you know, call IS and try and find things via a MAC address, by saving those FTEs, they were able to focus in on, you know, providing those clinical engineering services in a timely manner and getting those assets repaired and back in circulation quickly. Um, the other thing that we realized was is you know as it relates to asset utilization our asset utilization went up by about 25 percent um you know and you know it was continuing to grow but what that allowed us to do was to it allowed us to avoid a capital purchase of an additional 300 uh iv pumps and modules um and so that was really beneficial the other thing that we realized was is lost assets we recovered, um, you know, several tens of thousands of dollars in lost assets that people thought were no longer in the system. They no longer thought they were there. And through the circulation of PMs and the tagging process, we started to find these assets that had just sat in closets or, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in drawers or in bathrooms or random places. Um, and so we were able to recover those. One of the things, though, that we did do that was unexpected with this system was when the WannaCry virus hit, um, we needed to be able to go out and address those assets that were vulnerable to that WannaCry virus. And one of the things that we were able to do was quickly respond in a really efficient manner to go out, find those assets, and get them remediated quickly. And so it really in, increased our efficiency in that response and really helped the facility and the hospital in general. Um, and so after that, it's been used that way multiple times. That's great, great insight, Chris. So Danielle, um, back to you. What would be your top best practice recommendation? Yeah, I would say documentation. Um, you need to make sure that you develop a good process um, with documentation. 
um, and meaning that to speak to Chris's earlier point, you want to make sure that your equipment, that um, the people who your team that are tagging your equipment are familiar with it. I always recommend taking a picture. Um, showing where that asset tag is going to be placed and then that way you only have one asset tag per piece of equipment because if you have a team um, I did I have seen where unfortunately you may have two tags on one piece of equipment and um, so you want to utilize what you have um, share that knowledge across uh, define what's that best location on that piece of equipment that it doesn't interfere with the um, any kind of servicing or the activity that uh, the equipment is required for um, but not just that piece of it sharing you know documenting that and sharing with your tagging team but also to make sure it gets in the system because otherwise you just have a piece of equipment out there um, that, yeah, on the back end, uh, you know, the clinical engineering may be able to pull it up because they know, but it's not useful to the end user because they can't search for it. So you want to make sure, I mean, you know, the old adage is if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. Well, it applies here. You may put an asset tag on a piece of equipment, but if staff um, from the top end to the bottom end of uh, at the hospital, if they cannot search uh, the system and find it, then then the system's not useful for them. So you need to make sure that there's a good process in place of making sure that the equipment gets into the system as quickly as possible, so staff can um, can find it. Well, fantastic. And listen, I appreciate the insights from both of you, and I think it's unique and refreshing to get uh, the perspective from um, nursing, the nursing perspective. So with that uh, said, uh, we will begin to open it up to questions and answers for, uh, for all three of us. We've already got um, a number of questions that have come through, and I believe, Jennifer, you wanted to come back on and, um, and make a comment. Yes, thank you so much <clears throat> for this valuable information. I just wanted to remind all of our audience that if you would like to ask a question, please use the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard. We will address as many questions as we can today, and if not, your question will be passed on to the panelists so that they can answer them after the webinar. And I will hand it back over to you now, Dave, to uh, to start with the questions. Great, I appreciate it. Um, I've had a couple of people that were curious, um, Danielle, about um, your role. So could could you expand on what your role was at HCA? Yes, thank you. Um, so originally I was part of their IT team uh, with third-party applications, and then I. Um, took a position at a specific hospital um, that was identified for um, all the various technology. It was um, called a hospital of the future. And so what I did there was I um, helped implement and educate and uh, roll out uh, these various uh, programs such as uh, asset tracking. Very good. Chris, um, a couple of questions that came in about tag battery life. What would you say are the considerations that influence tag battery life? You know, so the big things related to, to you know, battery life, there's a couple of things. One is utilization. So if you have an asset that is moving around uh, locations and it's being moved um, or, you know, you've got a piece of equipment that, that has a vibration in it that's causing a constant vibration to where it, that tag senses that it's constantly in motion um, and it's sending regular updates, that's going to be uh, a big factor in your battery utilization. Um, but really, that's the, that's the one thing that I would say, like, we found that we had certain pieces of equipment that were 
constantly being utilized and the battery life on those pieces of equipment you know would definitely be different than those pieces of equipment that weren't utilized that often a bladder scanner that may be set in the same location and was used you know a couple of times a day great and right along with that another question was chris or danielle how long does it take the system to recognize the battery was replaced? So that depends upon the tag. Um, that can take, um, depending upon the tag. So, you know, if you take a regular asset tag, that could take uh, a few seconds to update. If you look at some of the, the multi-mode tags, the capacitor in those are bigger. So it takes a little bit longer for that to discharge um before it will you know and then when you put in the new battery then it will recognize that new battery change so it could take anywhere from a few seconds to you know say a minute um for that battery to, to completely discharge okay and then danielle um what was your experience asset utilization assumption uh, assumptions uh that were made when a device is in a patient room, uh, is it considered in use? Yes, so um, great question. And it all depends um, when you have some uh, sites and or even units and they like to stage patient rooms and have a particular amount of IV pumps and monitors and everything already in the patient room. Um, and then you have other units that they like things to be centrally located um, in more of a storage area and then to pull it out as needed. So um, the way that the system worked is if it was in a patient room um, where I was, it was considered in use and um, and, and so that's why um, having it more in a centralized location rather than staging in the room, because then you can pull as needed um, is, is a good workflow. Good, good. And then there was a question directed at me, uh, Dave, with uh, CMMS providers, and this person must be referring to CMMS software. Do you integrate with output data to eliminate double entry for the biomed staff? And that is exactly uh, the integration that um, Vizio would perform uh, with our asset management software. So we would integrate with uh, you know, the popular CMMS packages and have done that uh, for healthcare providers around the, uh, around the country. So yes. Um, Chris, how specifically do you measure asset utilization as a KPI? So what we looked at was, um, you know, like Danielle said, you know, you look at the asset in the room. Um, and so when we initially did this, we initially looked at if there was an asset in the room, then we consider that asset to be being utilized in the room, right? So we, like for an IV pump, if there was an IV pump and a couple of modules in the room, we considered that asset in use. Um, as the program grew and expanded over time, what we started to look at is we started to take the data from the EMR and actually look to say, is there a patient in the room and is there a piece of equipment in the room take those two things and marry those two things together. Um, and then that's what we determined to be asset utilization. Beyond that, what we really started to do, um, EMRs, you know, I started to do, you know, IV infusion management to where they are associating a device, a specific device to a patient. And so we were able to pull some of that data into our analytics platform to, you know, garner whether or not an asset was being utilized. Um, earlier when you were talking, uh, you know, when Danielle was referring to the pumps in the room, one of the things um, that has, you know, come out recently is the ability for 
the pump manufacturer to send notification back to say when it's actually running so that you truly know that that pump is being utilized at that point in time. Great. Um, this is a question and I'd, I'd like to get uh, the answer of your perspective from, from both of you. Based on the current <clears throat> environment with the pandemic, how can RTLS with, assist with dealing with COVID-19 issues? So for me, I think that um, you're able to, with assets properly tagged, you can shift resources as necessary. So if you have a, um, say you are um, opening up an overflow unit, and now all of a sudden you need teleboxes and IV pumps and SCDs and all of the various things. You need to be able to very quickly locate that equipment throughout the hospital and then shift it over to the new unit. And um, when you have proper asset tracking, that can really um, decrease the amount of time, the prep time, so that then you can decompress that ER extremely quickly. Chris, what's your perspective? Yep, I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, really being able to load balance a hospital when it comes to assets um, is really important. And not only assets, but you can do this with staff as well, right? You can look at, you know, the staff that you have in a department and start to look at and say, can I potentially use this staff that's over here in a better way? and really start to load balance not only your assets, but all of your resources um, within your facility. And then just beyond assets, you know, when you start to look into, you know, other functionalities of the RTLS system, you know, with regards to infection prevention and contact tracing and things like this, um, it really opens up those capabilities to help, you know, during these pandemic times. Great. And then there was a question directed at, uh, at me, how, uh, Dave, how large can an RTLS uh, track assets or can you track assets across multiple facilities? And the answer is absolutely yes. We do it now. One of the big benefits with a system-wide uh, deployment of RTLS on the same platform is the ability for stakeholders to track where their assets are. And we've seen in uh, numerous examples where assets get transferred uh, with patient transfers uh, from facility to facility. And when you have all of the facilities on the same homogenous platform throughout the system, then um, the benefits of tracking assets that get transferred in our facility or um, there's a reason for a rental pool to be exchanged between facilities all of that stays apparent and visible and you don't lose assets you don't track you don't lose track of assets and of course at the end of the day as we talked about earlier then you don't watch um, dollars walk out the door and um, raise your operational cost. So yes, uh, that can that can be done. Um, Chris, a question for you. In this tight budget season, what's the financial justification for RTLS in your opinion? You know, so Dave, two things. One, I wanted to piggyback off of what you just said there um, regarding enterprise deployments. One of the things that um, you mentioned earlier is real-time notifications, getting those alerts. One of the, the big benefits um, that I've seen in enterprise deployments is that ability for, uh, you know, when an asset leaves a facility to get an alert, but not only that, but when it shows up at another facility to be able to send an alert to the originating facility to say, hey, we have your asset. Um, and then they're no longer having to go look in the system. They automatically know that they've got an asset that they need to go recover from a different site. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But right. we, yeah, with regards to the question, you know, 
the financial drivers really are in these times, you know, especially with everything going on in the pandemic, we are resource constrained. And so being able to better utilize our resources and not having to go out and purchase more capital or go out and acquire rentals to meet the demand and being able to meet the demand with, with what we have is really where that financial benefit comes. Um, and then it also allows you to more operationally be efficient um, and to drive, you know, really preeminent care across your facilities um, during these times. I agree. Um, and to add on to that, um, Danielle, system upgrades. What did you find was a good schedule to maintain the system? So because um, the there it was so heavily integrated, um, the RTLS system, and we wanted to make sure that we had an all hands on deck approach. A lot of our monthly uh, system maintenance, we would actually do a uh, day shift during the week so that we made sure that we had the key stakeholders from our vendors to our IT departments and we could test and make sure that everything was up and functioning and running um, rather than doing um, any kind of maintenance uh, on the off hours. I know off hours are great for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of maintenance, but because this, uh, you know, we used RTLS with our nurse call, which was staff to rest and, and patient tracking and asset management and hand hygiene and everything, that it was just very important to make sure that when it went down, it went, uh, it went down, got the maintenance, and then came right back up. So we would do that usually, um, uh, you know, around like a three o'clock time frame uh, on a day shift, like a, thir um, a Thursday. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, Chris, uh, a couple of questions. People were curious about your role at IU Health and then several were asking were you involved or did you have any input into vendor selection? Great questions. I uh, appreciate both of them. So, you know, my role at IU Health, um, when, it, you know, when I started with RTLS, I was brought in to lead the project. Um, and so I was part of the selection committee at that time went through the selection, you know, develop those standards, work with all of our key stakeholders to develop those standards, implemented the project with IS and clinical engineering, and then transitioned into a support role to where I owned that system. I was in charge of the support and the daily operations of our RTLS platform and our nurse call platform. Um, and that was at one of our, uh, you know, kind of hospital of the future facilities as well. And then I transitioned into a role where I was responsible for evaluating technology selections for the entire enterprise, which consisted of 18 hospitals and, you know, 56 clinics, I believe is, is where, you know, when I uh, departed, I think that's how many clinics that we had. And during that time, I actually, uh, you know, helped to set the system standard for our RTLS implementation. And then also, to drive the way that it was going to be implemented and used across all of our facilities. Okay, fantastic. And then um, another question came in. I think Chris and I addressed this earlier, but um, we can both chime in on this and this. Uh, the question is, can there be an alarm notification if a device leaves a specific area? or the building and that answer is absolutely yes and it's very common uh, to uh, have key doorways entrances exits marked with the technology and uh, the business rules can be set up to send alerts to um, designated recipients 
that that need to know that either you know that information has gone from an area it shouldn't or it's left the building so that absolutely can be done i don't know chris if you'd like to add any more insight or danielle to that but um well, I know, the, the um, thing i think yeah well, I was, I say, the one thing i would add to that is you know you can also cover other you know points of, of exit such as laundry chutes or laundry rooms um, you know, so that, you know, a lot of times we'll see, you know, telepacks that end up in laundry rooms or laundry chutes and things like this to make sure that those are, um, those are captured. And from a reporting standpoint, you know, finance loves to see that, you know, the hospital and this system has prevented, you know, this equipment from leaving the facility, which equates to this number of dollars. Danielle? Yes, that's exactly, I was uh, going to point that out. I know one good example um, are NICU stethoscopes. They are extremely expensive. So um, we worked with um, our asset tagging team in order to tag that. Um, and the reason we did was because one of, the, um, one of our stethoscopes wound up in the trash. And um, so we did not want that to happen again because it's very uh, expensive. And uh, so whenever, uh, if it was inadvertently left in bed in a linen or anything like that, and it got taken into the soil utility, then we had that LF exciter that would let the staff know, okay, this piece of equipment is in here. And uh, that way they could uh, recoup it very quickly. Danielle, that's kind of amazing. Um, we actually did the exact same thing at um, the facility that I implemented this at um, was the NICU stethoscopes. That's that's kind of amazing that that's something that you ran into as well. Common issues all throughout the hospitals. This is Chris, true. Um, someone, I think, I think Chris, you were the one that mentioned telepax. I think you did. Anyway, someone's picked up on that. Um, the question is telepax is a tracked asset. Um, was it active RFID? Not sure if you've got a comment on that or not. It was active RFID for the telepax. That is correct. Okay. All right. And it was it was yep. And it was active for for all the assets that we were tracking. All right. Very good. So. All right. Well, that's uh, I appreciate. Um, you know, Danielle, you and uh, Chris, your participation today. Um, that's uh, the majority of the questions. We we do have um, other very very specific uh, questions that we will get a response back to, uh, as uh, Jennifer outlined. And uh, Jennifer, at this point, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, I'd just like to say thanks to the panelists and thanks to the audience, and thanks to MD Publishing. Thank you, um, all of you, Danielle, Chris, and Dave. That was a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone in our audience to visit today's sponsors, Vizia Technologies and Centrac, to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit viziatech.com and centrac.com. A quick reminder to our audience, that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. This survey will be emailed to you one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great day.